My name's Lysia Heath. I'm CEO of Women for Election and a very big welcome to you today and a very big welcome to our guest, Angie Bell, the member for Moncrief. Angie, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you all this afternoon uh, to answer any of your questions and give you a bit of an insight into my journey. Um, Angie, I have, just as we're starting this, I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm getting in a fire alarm where I am. So at this point, right. can you hear that? Yes. <laughs> um, okay, this is something new that's happened at Women for Election in Conversation Monthly Series. Bear with me in case it's a drill, but I think we're going to be fine. Flexibility um, is really important. <laughs> Contingencies. This is what we teach in our campaign training all the time. Absolutely. Um, now, look, I, I think it's important that I acknowledge that I'm coming to you on the lands of the Gadigal and the Bidjigal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and I'd love for you to acknowledge where you're joining us from, where you're dialing in from around the country today. Feel free to put it in the chat uh, I would note that sovereignty of this land was was never ceded. And I, I believe that until we reach uh, Makarata or treaty with uh, First Nations people in Australia, then our ability to move forward together in harmony is compromised. So, um, Angie, I have so much that I want to talk to you today. And you have such... Um, such a diverse and colourful career history uh, that <laughs> then led you to politics as well. And we love hearing those stories and we love talking about how, um, about normalising people's experience into politics. Before we talk about your elected career, can we talk about your career before politics and and can you work into that answer for us how that career ultimately led you to politics? Were you always a political person? Had you touch a political wonk about you? Like, how did how did that all happen? Thank you so much for asking that very uh, interesting question. And because everybody has a different journey uh, in life, indeed, and certainly into politics. But I'm coming from uh, to you from Surface Paradise and the electorate of Moncrief on the sunny Gold Coast. Uh, which is Kumbumera of the Yugambeh language, just to let everybody know uh, where I am placed right now. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging also. Um, so my journey is kind of a bit unusual, I'm told, because I had quite a long and fulfilling couple of careers in tandem, as many women do, uh, and trying to get ahead as a young person working uh, during the day, but also uh, an evening career, if you like. And no, it's not dark and dangerous, uh, but it was, uh, I was working since I was about, I guess, 14 years old in sales in the local music shop. Um, I was drawn to music as a young person and it really is music that gave me all of my opportunities. So I started playing the saxophones uh, when I was in junior high school and that led me to very many opportunities uh, and still does in my life and that's why I'm so passionate about uh, equality of opportunity particularly for young people, because that's what changed my life. As a young person in high school, uh, my music won me pretty much a scholarship to Denmark uh, as a Rotary Exchange student. And I was from a low socioeconomic background. And so that changed my life. Uh, and it made me passionate about helping young people to access those opportunities that can change their lives. And um, it's just serendipitous now that I'm the shadow for, for youth, uh, among other things. But my journey really began when a girlfriend of mine here on the Gold Coast, a Surface Paradise resident said to me, do you want to meet Joe Hockey for your birthday? Uh, <laughs> and I said, sure, absolutely. I'm a liberal nerd. Uh, and uh, at that time I was working in my night job as well, which was uh, in a, a band. And so I worked as a professional musician, as a saxophonist for about 35 years and traveled throughout um, the Americas and Asia Pacific performing playing whatever they paid me to play. Uh, but we, you know, we played in Honolulu and Hawaii, Las Vegas, um, Malaysia, and, and had I had a pretty amazing time playing saxophones and singing backing vocals for a corporate band. And so um, not only was my band then asked to play at this function where Joe Hockey was the guest speaker, um, but uh, it was an opportunity for me 
to rub shoulders, I guess, with politicians. I wasn't a member of the party. Um, I simply had an opportunity and a door open for me. And when I met Joe Hockey at that event, um, and I've got a picture behind me, you can probably see um, a picture behind me there of the moment that we met. Uh, we, we really hit it off and Joe was very interested in my life story and he inspired me um, over many years to, to do something. He said to me, you can do something and you can have a voice. Uh, and so I'd written a, a book for small business for my day job um, and it was, I've got it here. It's called Retail Rebranded. And I asked Joe to be on the back. <laughs> There's the same photo. <laughs> same photo. Uh, and so... Joe uh, at that time was the shadow treasurer and he agreed to be on the back of my book and to endorse it. So he, I had a glowing report on my book for small business and he was um, one man of very many who have supported me from the very beginning. And so um, I then went to Canberra uh, as a guest of another minister, government minister, and the same girlfriend who worked for um, a minister at that time. And I was privy to hearing the Prime Minister, who was Tony Abbott at the time, Julie Bishop, Foreign Minister at the time, uh, Bruce Bilson as well, privy to hearing them coming into the room and addressing um, an audience. And I was so lit up by what I heard and I was inspired. I said it in my maiden speech. Amazing. Um, a great aspiration unfolded. And so I came back to Queensland and I joined the Liberal National Party and I was aged 45, I think. I just had my 10th anniversary of being in the party. There I is have, more. I have my fire alarm going, so I put myself on mute. <laughs> okay. um, I, I think it. I, I. I'm so inspired by your story, but I, you know, I know that you. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to meet Joe Hockey as well, so I understand the inspiring element to that, to that, to that component. Um, in particular, you know, going straight back to Queensland and then joining the party, and then. Before you were elected, this is before you were elected still, and but you you obviously a little bit happened at pace because before too long you were actually state president of the Liberal National Women's um, Party. Is that right? Have I used the right terminology there? Uh, LMP and, Women's State President, that's right. Yeah, between 2017 and 2019. So you know, we're super interested and our alumni are super interested about how those, you know, how those elected roles happen. Like, is there a pre-selection exercise that happens for those? Because they must be very coveted. Um, so so what is the process to go through to, to become those roles, to get those roles? Sure. Well, I think the first thing, obviously, is to join a political party that aligns with your values. Uh, and once you've joined that party, you go along to party meetings. And I was in a situation where at the time I was working a day job as a national development manager for 120 retail uh, and trade stores around the nation. And I was traveling a lot throughout Queensland. And so um, the role of women's state president has a lot of travel uh, and it has a lot of volunteer hours uh, where you are um, given, given by the membership the great responsibility of being um, their president. And so to cut a long story short, I went back to Queen, came back to Queensland, I joined the LNP, and then I was introduced to LNP women. And at that time, Theresa Craig, Dr. Theresa Craig was the president and she had been the president for two years. Uh, and I had a number of women in the party who supported me, who wanted me to achieve and to those women I thank them they were on my executive they know who they are uh, and they pushed me forward as vice president for LMP women uh, and that occurs at the state conference every year and you can nominate um, through the proper party processes of nominating for an AGM for a an executive position uh, and then the party who are at the AGM and who have registered at the AGM vote. And during that process, it is, you're right, Alicia, like a pre-selection, you get to speak for, I think it's about three minutes from memory where each candidate stands up and tells the membership why uh, they are worthy or what they are going to achieve for LNP women. And so I shared my vision, my background in marketing, what I could do to help the party 
uh, and how uh, keen I was to support the women uh, in the Liberal National Party. And um, they uh, very gratefully uh, voted for me as women's vice president. The following year, Theresa Craig stepped down because she'd done three years as president uh, and uh, she was an outstanding president. And I was put forward as the uh, as a nomination for LNP Women's President. Uh, there were some other nominations uh, from memory uh, and I was then returned with my complete executive team intact the following year as well. So I was vice president for a year and president for two years. Great privilege. Yeah, not only um, a great privilege, but a great opportunity to to really see the the machinations of um, the party at work. Uh, I'm sure it gave you extraordinary insights and knowledge yes. and visibility for what came next. <laughs> um, yes, and a track record as well, um, because let's you know let's remember that the Liberal National Party are all volunteers. Um, everybody in the party, including the party state president, who's currently Lawrence Springbull, um, is a volunteer. And so they give their time, um, they give their funds, they give their you know, their travel, their fuel, everything that you do, um, you, you give as a volunteer. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. And that, of course, uh, bodes well in the party environment. If you work for the party selflessly, um, that, you know, you earn people's respect because they know the work that you've done. Yes, I think it goes a long, long way and it's not lost on me that I uh, we continue to see this um, journey for women entering into the political sphere as well. Um, but if we if we then, I mean, you were you were state president and then if if I'm correct, the the sitting member of Moncrief um, uh, retired, uh, which obviously thrust that electorate into a by-election or sorry, not a by-election, a pre-selection process. That's right. And you put yourself forward for that pre-selection process. And I was reading the different newspaper articles at the time. Uh, you were you were one of nine and you beat eight others in that pre-selection process, much apparently to the surprise of, of many. So um, congratulations on doing that. Uh, you know, it must have been a satisfying process. Do you want to talk to us about that process at all? <laughs> I'm not sure satisfying was the word I was using at the time. Uh, it, it does uh, thrust you into an environment uh, that is... Um, competitive and uh, for those women who are listening who might be in roles uh, across corporate Australia or in business, uh, it is very similar to that environment. And going back to what you said before, Lucia, the party environment where you're at state convention, where you're speaking to party units, where you're travelling around the state uh, is a really good training ground for being an MP. Uh, and I sort of found that in the Liberal National Party at state convention when you're putting... Um, when you're speaking to a motion or an amendment to the entire party on the convention floor, uh, it is excellent practice for uh, speaking in Parliament uh, and understanding the standing orders in Parliament, which is so important as well. So it's a really good training ground and that's the point of having a political party is that you train your people up uh, within the party and then you choose as a party the best people certainly in the case of the Liberal National Party, the best people to represent their communities. And so, um, I, you know, I just want to put that forward, that uh, that's what a political party is for, to grow their own political um, prowess, if you like, or talent. Yes, um, I couldn't agree more. And I think something, we, we've had such generous time donated by different members of political parties to come and do pre-selection masterclasses for us and things like that deliberately to show um what that process is and equally um the campaign that you run before you run a, an electoral campaign yes. is a selection campaign yes um, and right. let's make it transparent because the more transparent we make it the more likely particularly women are to say okay I can do that I know that's a known quantity I can step into that now I think what happens is when you decide to run for politics, you need your network around you. 
And I can remember sitting at my kitchen table and uh, texting a neighbour across the road and saying, would you like to come over for a Chardonnay and help me stuff envelopes? Uh, <laughs> And we were, you know, stuffing 500 envelopes for my pre-selection because there were 500, approximately 500 uh, members in this federal divisional council in Moncrief. And so whilst I knew many of the party members, uh, there were many on the list that I didn't know. So what happens is, um, yes, uh, in this case, the member for Moncrief, Stephen Chiobo, decided that um, he wanted to hang up his boots and uh, that is then sent out to the membership that the seat is open for nominations. And at that point, if you've been in the party, uh, you can put your name forward to nominate for the pre-selection. Um, there's a fee associated with that. And there are there is a, a rigorous, what I would say, a very rigorous process that you go through in terms of the applicant review committee process where you are asked many questions by a committee uh, for the party and also um, you uh, undertake police checks, tax returns, you have to have all of your personal affairs uh, in order um, and in my case, gosh, my entire driving history across I think four states that I'd lived in. Uh, so I had to go through all of that as well. And I had three weeks, I think, from the the date of when the nominations opened to when the pre-selection was. And at that time, I had also stepped away from being women's president uh, in order to gain some experience in an MP's office because I hadn't worked at all for an MP or come from any kind of political background apart from the party. So at the time, I was working for a state member uh, and I'd worked there for about eight weeks. And so I had to step away from that as well because I was earning money from the Crown, uh, which, of course, is against the rules. And so uh, I uh, went through that process and I studied a lot um, about LNP policy uh, at the federal level. Uh, and I worked as hard as I possibly could on being the best that I could possibly be for those pre-selectors. Uh, and the pre-selection is called usually in a community hall environment. It was at a local school here. And um, we had about 150 or 160 uh, pre-selectors came out for that. Yes, there were nine candidates, but I was very proud that we had five out of the nine were women and all of them had been through um, some of the programs that I put in place as LNP Women's President to recruit, ready and raise to represent, which was my strategy for LNP Women for the years that I was um, on the executive or at the president and vice presidency. Uh, and so I was, I would have, for me, it would have been a win if any of those women won, frankly, because I'd been working for so many years and we had, as an executive, uh, women's executive, we'd been successful at pre-selecting Senator Susan MacDonald, um, we had also supported Senator Amanda Stoker to get uh, three or two women in that case and then myself um, afterwards. So I wanted a, women, a, a woman to win and with five out of the pre-selection of nine, it was, all, it was not a certainty, but certainly it pushed the odds up that we would have a, a female member for Moncrief. Uh, and it just happened on the day that the pre-selectors felt that I'd put forward the best argument um, it was a long and arduous day. It was about a six and a half hour pre-selection. So each candidate gets um, sort of seven and a half minutes to give a speech and then uh, roughly the same, I think it's eight minutes to answer questions from pre-selectors and each candidate is asked the same question. Uh, and so you've got your 15 or 16 minutes to shine yeah. and you've got one shot. Uh, and it was a... It was a funny day. It was a um, a very exciting day. And I felt, I don't know if any of you have ever had that moment in your life where all your nerves just drop away and all the work that you've done throughout your whole life all comes together in one place. I almost felt like my late mother was standing behind me, pushing me oh. forward and calming me. And I felt... I can remember sitting in the, in the in a classroom where we were all sitting as candidates going into the hall um, and looking up above a door and there was an exit there and the school, the teacher had written on a piece of paper above the exit, through every exit is also an entry. Hmm. And 
I can remember it really touching me and I felt really quite emotional on that day. Um, and the rest kind of is history. I won by two votes. Um, but I did, which is 50% more than I need. I only needed one um, to win, but I had one up my sleeve, um, well, you know. Um, yeah. but, but the, you know, I, I really believe that the good people of the Federal Divisional Council usually make the right choice that they feel is the best person to represent their community. And that's the strength of the Liberal National Party. Uh, I don't believe they ever get it wrong because they choose the person that they have the affinity with. Uh, and in this instance, they felt that I could do the job for them. And um, I'm still honoured and still pinch myself every day when I get in my car and I drive from Miami to Surface Paradise to my office. I think, do I really represent this beautiful electorate? No. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that. No, I, I think Philip has captured it beautifully in the comments there. Um, goosebumps. I haven't been but, watching those. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think not only have you shared that very personal story with us, it just the contribution of, of sharing what pre-selection is, is just always such a, um, uh, and, uh, an easier way for us to be able to demonstrate um, how women can get involved and that they're capable of doing it and um, and that it's not dissimilar to things they do every day uh, of every week of every year in whether it be in their corporate career or within their family or within their volunteer work so um, when you said all the nervousness melted away um, knowing that the Matildas play tonight, I keep hearing them say over and over, we're not nervous. You don't get nervous when you're prepared. So um, so I feel like you were prepared You were, and that's put you in that great stead. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, well, that's the, you know, the battle before the battle, but then came the actual federal election itself in in 2019 um, and though it might have been a surprise to the media that you'd won pre-selection it sounds like it wasn't going to be it wasn't a surprise in the room or necessarily um, to you and your preparation either when you look back at the federal election now um, what you know they're not easy they're not easy but there's, <laughs> also, there's also fun bit like can you remember whether it's the 2022 election or the 2019 election did you have fun while you were out on the hustings? Like, what are some good memories you remember from those election campaigns? Oh, goodness me. I think, you know, interacting with the volunteers on all the all the polling booths uh, and the pre-polls, which is two weeks prior to the election, um, that is always a highlight. And I think at the last election it was bucketing down rain at five o'clock in the morning when they were all out there putting up all the bunting and all the signs and everything. And at first my first thought was oh oh gosh you know all those volunteers are out there for me and they're they're sort of putting up signs and in the rain and raincoats and many of them are uh, older Australians so you know many of them are people from the community around here who have been uh, members of the Liberal National Party for 50 years some of them you know and so there they are out there plastering my face all over the place because they believe in me so a lot of uh a lot of politics or representative politics is about thinking about your people when you're standing up for them. And so, of course, you have fun. You have as much fun as you possibly can. Uh, it's not all fun. I'm, you know, I'm sure it's not fun when um, it's a marginal seat and there's only 1% or half a percent or less, you know, hundreds of votes in it. Um, but I sort of have the view that I try and make the most of every day. And if uh, if things change, because, um, you know, political careers generally end pretty badly, let's say, not many end um, terrifically well, uh, really, when you look at it. Um, so I think you've got to be prepared to have the helicopter view and say, okay, well, I'm doing the best I can for my community and in the roles that I've uh, been tasked with and privileged to have. And when that, you know, when that finishes, it finishes. and um, and until that time, I'll throw absolutely everything I have into this role uh, and and stand up for the people who are standing up for me. It's very humbling. Even just last Saturday night, I was at the Kurrawa Surf Life Saving Club event 
uh, for its 65th um, awards night. And one of the fellows there manned my polling booth and his wife manned my polling booth at the last election and the one before and um, also supported the former member. And I was scooting around the dance floor with him on Saturday night. And he's an elderly gentleman. He's in his, um, well into his 70s, I would say. Uh, but he stands up for me. He supports me. You're doing a good job. You know, um, to hear that from someone like that in the community who has given to that surf club for 50 or 60 years of his life uh, and his wife and the role that she's played there, they are the things that just keep your feet on the ground. Visiting, I've got nine surf clubs in my electorate. I did my surf bronze at Mermaid Beach Surf Club right in the middle. And um, they are the things that keep you going when the going gets tough. They are the people that I think of when you have a bad day, which you always do. Um, you know, you might have a media interview that you, where you don't say exactly the things you would have liked to have said and somebody takes it out of context and next minute, you know, people are saying things about you that aren't necessarily close to the truth. And it's those people at Currawa Surf Club, it's those guys at the men's shed in Ashmore that I spoke to this morning, um, it's the high schools, the sporting clubs, it's the salt of the earth that, really keep you going and that's why you do it and if you're not doing it for that reason you're probably doing it for the wrong reason wonderful um thank you again for sharing that i i think that's very accessible uh, not just for our alumni but for women across the country who who um already do get involved in school awards and surf life saving or absolutely and that's where it all starts yeah community yeah. engagement is everything yeah very accessible. Um, so you so you ran in your first federal election in 2019, and you you won your first your first go, and <laughs> um, which is an amazing achievement and something we often talk about in our training and with our alumni that on average on average it takes three times to run before somebody gets elected. Um, that changes depending on the tier of government and so forth, but how uh, it doesn't always happen um, the first time. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy for you that it, that it did in 2019. And I, I read your first speech. Um, uh, not, we don't call it maiden speech anymore. Remember everyone, it's the first speech now. Um, and there was a lot of things that um, really, uh, inspired me about what you said, including also because we like to celebrate firsts at Women for Election, but I want to make sure that I quote you properly from this. Um, in terms of in your opening speech, uh, you noted that um, you were the first openly gay gay woman in a major party in the House of Representatives. And you said that whilst you don't consider it your highest achievement to date and nor define your defining quality, you appreciated that it was a special milestone and you stood with the LGBTQI plus um, community and other minority groups to celebrate that diversity. Um, thank you for, for um, including that in your first speech. And I'm interested to know firstly, how it was received within the chamber and within your party as well. And I guess more broadly beyond that, knowing that you are being thrust into federal parliament, um, uh, you know, what support mechan mechanisms are there to, to help you um, learn <laughs> your, new, your new surroundings? Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And uh, I did uh, think long and hard about um, my first speech and what I would include and what I wouldn't. Um, because, you know, do you want attention to come to certain personal attributes or don't you? Uh, and I think most importantly, it's about being the first to do anything. And I think that um, many women, good, strong, capable women have come before all of us who have led the way in a lot of different areas. And we're seeing, gosh, the Matildas kill it at the moment. Good on them. It's like a you know, overnight success, 20 years in the making, 30, 40 years in the making, and so many people have invested so much in them to get them where they are, and women's sport more generally. And so um, at the time, I think we've even moved forward with um, 
with gay rights since then, really, uh, and with in, with inclusion and equality of inclusion um, around the country. I think we've actually um, since then moved forward. But I thought it was important to highlight that, as I said, not because it's something I wear on my sleeve or that I necessarily identify as, because I don't. I mean, in our household, I've been with my partner 22 years. She was married before uh, our relationship. She has four grown-up children. We have three beautiful grandchildren. So in our household, it's Grandma and Biba, and I'm Biba, um, which is a pretty special name. Um, and I was playing cricket this morning with my grandson, who's four, uh, in the garage because he likes to, you know, throw around the cricket ball. Uh, and so I, I just think it's important that we accept people for who they are and what they are. And that doesn't mean that everybody has to understand who they are or what they are. You simply need to accept who they are and what they are. Uh, and I wanted to make that point that there is, uh, after that comment, I think I said there is no room for discrimination in a modern Australia. And I stand by that. Uh, I try to support uh, the multicultural community here on the Gold Coast um, as much as I can. I'm so involved with the Indian community, uh, with the Chinese community here on the Gold Coast and any other, you know, subgroup that I can that I can be with, uh, I meet with um, the Yugen Bear language people, um, uh, you know. So I try to um, be as rounded as possible. It's not my defining quality. It's not something that I even think about, on it, you know, from day to day, but I'm sure others do. Um, and I think that the country has moved on since marriage equality came into place. And I note also that it was the Liberal Party that made that happen. Um, and so we are a broad church. And not everybody agrees on everything, but that's the beauty of democracy, right? Mm, agree. Uh, but I was also the first um, female saxophone player that my very good mentor for many years, Don Burroughs, said to me he ever saw in the public school system uh, way back in the early 80s. Now you see girls playing sax everywhere. Every high school yeah. band's got girls playing saxophones. So uh, it's... Uh, Lots it's of firsts. Terrific. Lots of firsts. Um, again, thank you, thank you for sharing. And like we celebrate firsts, um, but it's um, it's to celebrate them and then move on to the, let's make sure it's not the last. Yeah, mentality. Um, so um, and then uh, look, I have a couple of more questions, but then I'm going to pass it open to those who are asking questions in the chat and anyone that might want to ask additional questions. But you mentioned before, and you and I have had the opportunity to talk about this in Canberra, you know, in, in, in recent months, but I was so inspired to learn that you had been involved in, in training women in Queensland to run for public office. And I was going, well, that's what we do. Uh, but I think you were doing it first. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you've, I've written it here, recruit ready and raise. Is that what you called it before? Yes. The program? Recruit ready and raise to represent. Raise so to represent. Was- that was my strategy. So being in marketing, um, I understood that we needed a, a fulsome strategy for the women in the LNP. And so they were the key pillars of the strategy. So recruitment, and that meant, what did that mean, you know, on the ground? So as a key pillar to recruit more women is to engage with women. So that means events and functions, this sort of thing. Um, and so each key pillar had then, um, you know, four or five action points that we would undertake as an executive. So we would have um, an executive meeting. So obviously there would be the president, the vice president, the treasurer, uh, the secretary. And then I added a few extras um, just because I could. Uh, One was at that time, multicultural liaison uh, to the mix within the party, which was something that was new, hadn't been done before. Um, And then we, we had a couple of other roles as well in there it's just to broaden it out a little bit uh, so that uh, that went very well and we had um, you know a weekend at my place and lots of wine and cheese and um, we put together this this strategy so recruit was about events and it was about engaging with as many women as possible to bring them into the party which is kind of what you're what you're doing um, this was before zoom of course and it was before um covid yes we were used to living with zoom uh, so uh, we would do a number of 
events um, and we had some terrific events, really good um, events where we would have, we had Jacinta Price as one of our speakers, so we were ahead of our time. We knew she'd be an elected member of parliament at some point uh, and we had very many other speakers um, come to our events. Uh, we had International Women's Day events, that sort of thing, and we would um, make money. Um, for the party that way as well through events. Oh, so Recruit Ready was about having workshops for women and I also um, convened the first LNP Women's State Council. So uh, the party has a state council where you can get up and talk about, um, talk to motions and amendments and those sorts of things. The young LNP had their own state council where the young uh, under 30s could get up and do their thing uh, in their own forum, but the women didn't have one. So we started the women's state yeah. council so women could stand up to the microphone practice we'd have it at parliament house in brisbane uh, and that's a training ground if you like for women uh, to be able to stand up and speak to emotion which is really important uh, recruit yeah. so ready we also had workshops about public speaking um, about uh, media about you know all the different skills required um, and we would focus on that we'd have we scheduled them in at the beginning of the year so we'd have four of these you know six events four um, workshops, um, Recruit Ready Raise was about raising money because uh, uh, you do need funds, obviously fundraising. And we, you know, we did a really good job at LMP Women. That was probably one of the best year of fundraising ever. Um, and, but also about raising profiles. So we would, on social media, raise profiles of local candidates at the state election um, in, I want to say, 2016, was it? 27, I think it was 2016. Um, at that state election, I think I supported 11 women around the state who were oh. our candidates, um, and we got one across across the line at that time. Because so you've got your own alumni as well. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so that was basically our catch cry, and then, of course, to represent. So Recruit Ready Raise to represent um, and I think some of the women also added raised children in there so we had to be obviously family friendly <laughs> make sure that you know we had um, women could come on the weekend so we'd have some extra extra people there that would were happy to entertain the children that they needed to bring with them because of course that's just so important to, well to do I, you know I, I've I was I was so thrilled when you said I was I've been training women in Queensland and I just said how can, let's work together how can we work together and knowing that um and, and that's how we came to have you as our um as our august speaker today as well but you know knowing that women for election uh has won a federal grant to scale our work and that we'll be launching in about four weeks we'll be launching our national program of which the first place we um are visiting later this year place-based events through regional Queensland, uh, regional remote and also Metro Queensland. So uh, would love you to spread the word at the right time, Angie, um, but maybe even have you speak at one of our events. So let's take that off. Congratulations. There's no mean feat, uh, you know, to, to, to get what you've, where you've gotten in such a short amount of time. So well done you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Look, um, I, I am super keen to to throw it open to questions. I had a couple more here, but I think they're actually questions that people have asked on the chat. And we're going to go uh, off piste for a second. And I'm going to ask, um, I see three questions there. So I'm going to ask you to take yourself off mic. Might not be in exact order, but Ali, are you happy to ask your question off mic? Just sure. keep it precise, please. Yep. Um, that's been really insightful, Angie. Thank you for sharing your story. I was also an exchange student in Denmark in high school for a year, and it's had a really profound um, impact on my adult life. And I was just wondering about how your experience has impacted, um, in particular, your political life um, and how you work with your community. Absolutely. Uh, I can't say no to Rotary Clubs. So... <laughs> Whenever they ask me to speak, I'm there. Um, I'm happy to be their poster girl, absolutely. I think they told me I'm the only uh, person in the House of Representatives to have been a Rotary Exchange student, um, another first, but I'm not sure about that. I'm sure there'll be other parliamentarians who've been on a Rotary Exchange. Uh, but, yes, it changed my life on so many levels. Uh, it opened my eyes to art, drama, history, travel, language, um, you know, learning another language and being able to speak 
Danish um, has impact media directly. I mean, I have dinner regularly with the Danish ambassador, Pernilla Cardel, uh, in Canberra. Uh, I'm able to speak in Danish with her regularly. Um, when the Swedish delegation came out, I was able to chat with them, uh, albeit in Danish, and they spoke back to me in Swedish, uh, which we know we can understand. Um, so it's it's not it hasn't been the most useful language in the world, but it certainly is a skill um, that has helped me get on a level with so many people um, over so many years. And I'll, I will always be indebted to Rotary International uh, for that opportunity that changed my life coming from a very large public school and going through what was a bit like a pre-selection way back then. Uh, to be a Rotary Exchange student. And they chose, of course, the person who they felt would be most flexible in that environment abroad when you're living with four different families uh, and going to a school just rocking up one day cold and having to fit in with, with the school that you've been sent to. So um, it was it was a fantastic opportunity. I mean, you know, I cried myself to sleep every night for the first three months, as you probably did. Uh, but boy, did I grow uh, while I was there as a 17-year-old coming home as an 18 18 year old so it was um an outstanding experience that I would recommend to anybody whose children have the opportunity to go and do it at that age seminal sort of age where you you can be shaped uh and you meet so many people who are rocks of the community when it comes to Rotary International uh, staying with Rotary families for me was families who were doing things differently to my family and um, it was unveiled to me how how communities worked um, because before that I hadn't had any insight into any community service or community organisations or anything like that. So it um, it certainly was um, life shaping. Amazing. Thank you for the question, Ellie, and for sharing as well, Angie. Um, jo uh, Jordi, I was going to come to you next. Do you want to ask your question? Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Angie. Um, my question is about the women's division and the LNP. Um, I'm in the Victorian division of the Liberal Party in the Higgins FEC. And I think one of, well. the, <laughs> one of the issues that we have here is um, the women's division tends to, I guess, uh, involve a lot of women in, in a different stage of life. Um, and they tend to meet at times that really don't work for those of us in the corporate world or working mums or, or full-time mums. And I'm just wondering if you've got any experience on how we can perhaps, instead of, there can sometimes be a bit of a, a combative nature to that and how we could perhaps um, from the Victorian division learn something from the LNP on how we could bring together all women um, and to have those great opportunities that you talked about for, for all women. Well, what I've done up here in Moncrief is I've started a women in industry branch and um, that encapsulates those sort of uh, women who are working, who can't necessarily make it to a 10 a.m. or a 3 p.m. meeting, who uh, perhaps want an hour between work and going home where they can have perhaps a champagne and uh, perhaps some canapes and to discuss policy and to have the same opportunities but in a different way and I think it's really important that we keep reinventing what we're doing as good brands do uh, keep you know keep adding to our offer um, as uh, demographics change and I think it's well overdue uh, frankly in the LNP that we should have been having these uh, branches um, a long time ago and I've only just started this one it's almost a year old I think women in the industry on the Gold Coast and we meet in funky places where they only have good cocktails and champagne and, and we um, have uh, interesting engaging guest speakers and members get the opportunity to to mix with politicians that we we invite and I always go to them um, so members and new members have access to to me as well so um, I think that's really older important. women are willing to do that as well so it's like a collective group rather than sort of two separate groups or is it still separate well I worked very closely with Moncrief women who are the bedrock of Moncrief um, and they have supported me um, since before the pre-selection as LNP Women's President. Um, they are a very strong women's branch and they've been going for a long time. Uh, but they uh, meet on a, you know, a Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, but I worked with them to say, listen, I'm thinking about starting um, a new branch for women in business or women in industry. Um, are you happy for us to have that on a, you know, an evening? Of course, your members um, the, of your branch are welcome to come. Um, 
but we'd like to start this new branch so that we can have some activity that's a little bit different that works in with you. Uh, and I think that's how you take stakeholders along on the journey. You need to, it's the same in politics when you have to, you have to work with who you have to work with and you have to get a result where possible. So you need to engage with the stakeholders, take them along on the journey. And that's how I approached it um, as wanting to start that new branch. And then, of course, I got a, uh, a chairperson who was willing to, to be the chair and the executive and then the members followed. So uh, we meet um, probably four times a year and have um, great events um, that the women really love. Thank you for the answer. I can see a couple of people have just connected in the chat that realise that they both live in the same federal lecture, Higgins. Um, Higgins yeah. So I hope that um, new great uh, super uh, sub branch about to happen. I'm getting the gist. Uh, Julie, I'm coming to you for the next question. Can you take yourself off mute, Julie? Oh, I might ask it in case you, are you there, Julie? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Got you, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Angie, it was very interesting to hear the competitive process that you went through with pre-selection. Mm -hmm. And I was interested to hear how different that is um, to the process that you went through when you became a shadow minister. Um, you know, what were the steps that occurred? What was the process? Was it how you expected it? Is it different under different leadership? Well, the process to become a minister or a shadow minister is uh, up to the leader's discretion in the Liberal Party. Um, I think the Labor Party have a different process where their members of parliament vote, I believe, um, although I'm not part of a Labor caucus and haven't have never been, but I, that's what I believe it to, to be the case. Uh, so in uh, my case, um, I had a phone call from Peter Dutton who asked me to serve uh, as the Shadow Minister for Early Childhood Education and the Shadow Minister for Youth. Uh, and he said, young Ange. And I said, my illustrious leader, how are you? And this is kind of how it went. And uh, he said, I'd like you to serve as the Shadow for Early Childhood Education and Shadow for Youth. And this is a really difficult process that I'm going through, having to choose people for roles and exclude others uh, when I have such a strong team. Uh, and I said, it, it would be a great honour to serve under you, uh, Peter Dutton, and under your leadership. I said, I only have one problem. And he said, oh, what's that? And I said, I'm actually older than you, Peter because he called me young Ange and then uh he said well if you keep calling me illustrious I'll keep calling you young how does that sound <laughs> and I said you've got a deal there uh so he keeps calling me young Ange and I keep calling him the illustrious Peter Dutton but um he he asked me to serve um in that portfolio and of course I accepted that I would I would do any role that the leader of the Liberal Party asks me to undertake um, that's kind of a given. I mean, some people have said no, and I think um, the next time doesn't come. <laughs> um, and so this is something I, I talk to school students about, which is, you know, when an opportunity rise, arises itself to you, you must say yes, even if you think that you may not be able to do it or complete the task or undertake that particular role, say yes, because that's that's what grows you as an individual and that's what develops your acumen, uh, your abilities, your interpersonal skills, all kinds of things come from those sorts of opportunities. Uh, so then um, I guess there is a process in terms of what your new role is uh, and um, the leader is given resources by the Prime Minister. Uh, and so the opposition leader is given resources by the Prime Minister, how many staff he is allowed, allocated, and then the leader allocates those those um, resources out. And so I was um, very pleased when Peter Dutton allocated one staff member to one extra staff member to, to my team. Uh, and so I have one advisor who's based in Canberra for the portfolio work that I undertake, and that is to... Um, speak with all of the stakeholders around the country. There's a lot of travel involved. Um, meet with early childhood educators and centres. Um, go to regional Australia. Go to remote Australia, uh, and under really understand the sector 
and then of course altogether the policy position of the Liberal Party for the next federal election. So it's quite a bit of work involved in that and you can't do it alone. You're only as good as your team. And I'm very lucky to have a fantastic team. And I have an office manager here who's been uh, supporting coalition members for 32 years. And Peter Dutton honoured her in the party room just a, a few sittings ago. She was the first person to be honoured with um, a thank you award from, from him with a very nice bottle of red. Uh, and um, so she, without her, I would also be lost. She makes my life. Uh, much easier so you know you have the resources and if you have a good team and your team stays with you for um, an amount of time I'm very lucky to have very low turnover in my team so everybody's comfortable with what they're doing we have a really good workplace um, environment and the culture we have enough politics out there so we don't have any politics in here I won't allow it um, because we need to work as a cohesive team um, to to work for the good people of Moncrief and also work um, across the portfolio. So if you know, it's quite a lot. Um, thanks, thank you, Angie, and thanks for the question, Julie. It was a great question. Again, I guess we we've talked a lot about pre-selection this time, but also that question about allocating ministries or shadow ministries, like it's 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 totally opaque to us you know is it something you have to lobby for is it something that you never lobby for um so appreciate the the answer angie appreciate that that the last question is for katrina um we don't have angie for much longer you've been very gracious with your time but this is the last question yeah, th thanks, Lucia. Um, so, Angie, I guess as a woman in my thirties, I'm you know observing a lot of a lot of particularly friends that are going through the the child early childhood raising stage, um, and it's just I don't know, probably very naively flawed me um, the impact that childcare costs and subsidies are continuing to have um, on a lot of their abilities to participate in the workforce. If, of course, that is their choice appreciate that it's entirely a woman's right whether she wants to do that when she's raising children. Um, so I'd love to hear your position given obviously your shadow portfolio responsibilities on early childhood education, mm -hmm. um, how you think the early childhood education sector needs to change to support women's economic participation. Mm. Thanks for that uh, question. Uh, the sector is um, very, very complex and it, it runs under the... Um, the sorry we're just plugging in the power pack because my computer's about to go dead yeah i've got eight minutes left Hang on. <laughs> that's all um, right i had a fire alarm you're fine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my office manager of 32 years just saved the day see how she comes to thank you karen <laughs> comes thank to my karen. rescue <laughs> so yeah the sector is very complex it comes under the um the uh, quality framework and then each of the states and territories also have their own regulator so it's it's a very complex sector um, more than half of it is private the other half um, is not-for-profit um, and there are very many different elements that need to be looked at in terms of how it can be improved and I work I'm working meeting with um, the peak bodies across the nation uh, regularly and um, as I said before, working out what the coalition's policy would be. Um, what's recently happened across the sector is uh, that there's been a $4.7 billion injection by the Labor government to the childcare subsidy. Uh, and what they've done is increased um, the, uh, the level of income in each household from 356 thousand up to 530,000 and so um, pretty much the same families have been able to get more access to early learning and there hasn't been any money put aside for any new sort of infrastructure or for regional Australia to have access and so we've got a situation where on top of the cost of living crisis that we're in we've seen no access 4.7 billion dollars of extra childcare subsidy go into the economy which is inflationary in itself uh, but no extra access for any regional families. Um, and we think that, that there's, there's an equity issue with that. Uh, and so do those people in the country who have paid for this, or some of it, and are not getting their fair share in terms of being able to access any early learning, right? There are 
regional parts of regional Australia where you cannot access it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the sector has, because we have the quality framework, we have ratios in terms of teachers, early childhood teachers and early childhood educators, so ECTs and ECEs, uh, and we have ratios for each age group. And so, for example, um, in the zero to two space, you've got one educator for every four children. Really important for their safety, really important for the quality of, um, of their care. Uh, and so the problem is that there aren't enough educators across the nation for centres to run at capacity with those ratios. So currently there's about 21,000 um, openings, uh, vacancies for uh, ECEs across the country. Uh, and we don't believe the government's done enough work in preparing the sector for that $4.7 4, 4 billion injection of childcare subsidy. Um, look, I think it came from the right place in terms of wanting to help more women return to the workforce. Um, and, you know, there were two KPIs when it comes to early childhood education. The first one is the quality of care and early learning. And the second one is, as you rightly say, women's workforce participation. Uh, and under the coalition, uh, it was higher uh, than when Labor last le left office. And we'll see what happens with those numbers. Firstly, women are having to go back to work. Um, because they're having to pay the bills in this cost of living crisis. And so um, what that $4.7 billion has done effectively is added more demand to the sector. So more women have gone, okay, well, I can get more childcare subsidy now, so it's worth me going back to, to work for another day. Um, uh, but uh, they're going to the centre, can I have another day? And the centre's going, well, no, because we don't have enough educators to be able to push our capacity up to 100%. So many centres, not all, but many, um, are running at below their capacity. Um, and so in order for them to maintain their profitability in the private sector, um, they are having to put their rates up um, because their rents have gone up their cost, their cost of electricity has gone up, their food bills have gone up. And so that they are putting their prices up as well. So you can see what's happened with, we don't know how much of that 4.7 billion, but you can see that what we've been uh, warning the Labor government of, of that money vanishing uh, or going into um, centres in terms of price rises, uh, which has an adverse effect on out-of-pocket costs for parents, uh, that is happening now around the country, unfortunately. So while we did actually support that $4.7 billion bill, I, as the Shadow Minister and the Party Room, supported that bill, uh, I moved a pious amendment to highlight that they weren't, hadn't done enough to prepare the sector for the demand when it came to, um, to workers, firstly, and secondly, um, that... Uh, the, so sorry, the demand for the workers, and, and secondly, the thing about um, early childhood education it, is that... There's no access in the regions. So there's mm. two key points. Thanks, Katrina, for the question. And thank you for the comprehensive answer as well. And I think... I could go on about that for ages and ages and ages. No, well, I <laughs> think I it's... Won't. Well, and, you know, you'll find great interest in that with our alumni um, yeah. who have felt this <laughs> in more ways than one um, on the ground as well. So... And the fact that Women for Election has a very big mission to move more into regional and remote Australia to yeah. is because of the lack of women in political office in those parts of the countries as well, not just in Canberra, but in council, state government and so forth. Absolutely. So yeah. um, the, the, the regions are, are constantly, um, uh, I guess, too often seen as the poor cousin in all of these different asset classes. So yeah. um, absolutely. So we want to see, just finishing on that, we want to see more flexibility and um, more options for families, more choice. So what that looks like is what we're working on. Fabulous. Thank you, Katrina. And thank you. If we could all give um, Zoom Zoom hands for um, Angie for her time, very generously given us a full hour. Thank you again, Angie, and um, oh, and for sharing, you. you know, some of your personal stories as well. It really goes a long way to um, normalising how we talk about politics and, and shining a light on everybody's different journey into politics and how accessible that is as well. Um, I note that our next speaker next month for everyone is um, with Fran Day, 
Uh, Fran Day is from Remote Australia, who I met probably nearly three years ago now. She joined one of our sessions about potentially running for council one day. And Fran talked for hours about how she could never, ever, ever find the courage to do that. But a few months later, she did. And then she won. <laughs> um and, and now she's a counsellor uh, in Lockhart Shire and she mm -hmm. wants to share her experience because she was the one who said she could never, ever. Um, and I, I just think her story is is remarkable and we want to share that with everyone. So, mm -hmm. Angie, thank you. Uh, that, so I've put in the chat if you want to join for the our next session for that. Thank, thank you. you again, Angie. <laughs>